What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. I'm Jess Navarez, and I have a very special guest here with me today. None other than Jay March. And if you do not follow Jay on Twitter, uh, you're a loss. Jay and I have done multiple podcasts together in the past, and he is just one of my favorite guests. So I figured I'd bring him on here uh, to share his insight, his knowledge, and a point of view that I think we could all use this week. Uh, Jay, my friend, how are you? How have you been um, this week? I know it's been an emotional week for Cowboys fans and just kind of everybody in general, but how have you been? And then for the people that maybe don't know, give us a little background about yourself. Awesome. Thanks, Jess, for having me on. It's always a pleasure uh, to be here with you, spending some time. Um, So definitely thankful just to just to be here. Um, But yes, it has been a crazy, crazy, uh, I guess, ending of, of a year. Um, and it just happened so fast that, you know, you, you really can't anticipate when it'll happen, how it'll happen. And unfortunately, it was a little bit disappointing. Uh, and we'll get into get get into all that. Um, but a little bit of background about me. Uh, so I played seven years in the NFL. I went to the University of Akron in Ohio, uh, played for multiple teams <laughs> throughout my NFL career. I think I think I played for eight, eight teams. Oh, wow. Um, so within my within my seven years, majority of it spent with the Cowboys obviously, and then the Chiefs as well is who I started with. Um, So, uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm married. I have uh, a son and a daughter. And, um, you know, at this point, I am, you know, focused on being being a dad and, you know, everything like that. So that's the best job you could ever have. Really, It it is. uh, Are they football fanatics, too? Are the kids kind of in football or are they very like anti-football? How's that going? Uh, so my son, unfortunately, I got done playing um, when he kind of got the grasp of football. Uh, um, kind of like unfortunate because, OK, well, my career is over. But like he like now he's like super into football. He's at the age where he's six. And then uh, my daughter, she she likes running around and pretending to score touchdowns. Um, my son is more of a quarterback fanatic. So he likes uh, Patrick Mahomes. He likes Dak and he likes Josh Allen. Those are like his his guys when it comes to. Um, you know, watching football. So he was pretty distraught about the Bills Chiefs game because he didn't really know who to root for. Um, so, so with uh, with that being said, I mean, he's 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 really getting into football. So it's fun, kind of you know, talking about football and trying to keep it simple because he tends to like hear me talking about it and then he overthinks why they're doing this or doing that or um, you know things like that. So you know, they uh, he pick up on a lot of things. Um, you know, always. I would always get worried when it was like a Cowboys away game. So I'm like, you know, we got to be on our P's and Q's. We got to do everything the right way. So, um, <laughs> you know, he would always ask if the Cowboys game was home, home or away, um, you know, because he's kind of like, are they going to lose if they're, at, if they're away? And I'm like, no, it's just, you know, they don't play as well as they do at home. Um, so I was trying to explain it to him. So he was always freaking out whenever it was a road game. So he's <laughs> definitely into it. You know what? I think we were all there with your son this season, uh, honestly, seeing how it kind of plan, uh, played out. But that's awesome to hear. I love hearing that. And I love hearing that you're focusing on being a dad and just that part in your life. Because, you know, one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on here today was to get a former player's point of view, because I feel like a lot of people don't really understand a lot of these decisions and it's an emotionally charged week. I I get everybody's on their high of highs, uh, especially after the loss to green Bay. And then the decision to keep coach McCarthy around for another year to uh, finish out his contract. There's a lot going on in all things Cowboys world, as you know, but I value your perspective because you've been in there. You've been in that locker room. You understand the business side of it, but you also understand a side of it that I think a lot of people are going to benefit from hearing about. Um, one of my favorite conversations to have with you, and we've had it before on another podcast, but I want to do it on this one again, is how much of an impact a coach can have on a player. And specifically, you always talk about John Fossil and kind of the impact he had on you. If you want to get into that again real quick, we'll get into the McCarthy conversation in a little bit. But um, I love hearing your point of view on this because I also think Bones is a guy that does not get enough love when he should. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say the first time I spoke to Bones was we were actually finishing. Um, we actually played them in the playoffs again. You know, I want to say it was twenty eighteen or nineteen. I can't remember. Whenever we went up to the Rams and played them, um, and then the following year we played them at home, and you know it was pretty much a blowout win. And um, you know I get a tap on my shoulder after the game, and he's like, "Hey, you know I'm I'm, I'm a Coach Fossil. I'm a special teams coach here. I really respect your game." 
Um, and you just get after it. And that was probably the first time I had ever had a coach come up to me and kind of say, hey, you know, what a great job, you know, you do for your team and um, all that kind of stuff. So then, ironically, I happened to be a free agent that year. And, um, you know, everything kind of aligned with uh, Bones coming to Dallas. So um, getting a play for him for that year and really dive more into, you know, his coaching philosophy and how he is as a person and a coach. And um, a lot of the times we spent time like really, really explaining why we do things as players and what how we see it from our perspective. So he was always open, open to that, you know, and he's like, hey, you guys are out there. And, you know, if you see something that like I don't see, you know, from a coach's perspective, please let me know. We'll talk about it. We'll stay extra, um, you know, in meetings just just to talk about it. You can stand up and explain you know, why you might do this on, on kickoff return so that like the, you know, the returner has a better understanding of what everybody's wanting to do. So I think just appreciating, um, you know, the player's perspective, um, it makes you feel like, you know, there's, there's a coach out there who's willing to listen to you and who's willing to, um, even, even if your idea might not be so great, I mean, he'll sit there and he'll listen to it all day long. And then, you know, we might rep it in practice one day out of, out of the blue and it makes you appreciate man, this coach actually listens to you. And then, you know, you can go to him about anything, whether it's, you know, family issues, whether it's about, you know, my, my mind, my, my mental is just not right um, for, you know, this game. How, how can I go about this? You know, I'm kind of feeling awkward, some things I can do. Um, and he just tries to help you in any way he can, um, you know, as like I said, as a person, as a, as a player. And then uh, just on top of that, I mean, he's always, he's always excited. Um, he never really goes into the fact of, you know, I guess dog cussing someone out or, or anything like that. It's always about like, how can we fix the problem? Like what, let's highlight the problem you did. Like let's highlight what you did wrong on this play so that we can understand like the reason we don't do it this way. You know what I mean? And not a lot of coaches are like that. So, you know, we're all, we're all men and um, you know, we're all trying to, trying to fight to um, obviously win a Super Bowl and stuff like that. But the fact that, you know, he's, he's willing to, um, tell you you're wrong in a different way. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's the right way to do it. And not all players respond to that. I mean, you get some guys who right. are like, hey, you know, he's, he's being too nice, and then they go out there and do their own thing. But a lot of the times what you'll see is why he got voted the, you know, the top-ranked uh, special teams coach is because a lot of guys, you know, respond to that kind of coaching where it's like, hey, you know, especially from a special teams coach because, like, he deals with offense, he deals with – um, defense he deals with situational football and just the respect that he has for the game is like more than you know I've seen anyone have I mean he knows everything situationally from you know when we should you know spike the ball when we should you know throw it out of bounds you know all the situational stuff football wise you know he, he he knows everything about it and then he teaches us as players about situationally like why are we doing these things and it just makes you a better you know a better player and then outside of that obviously making us uh, better men um, because he talks so much about, you know, the love he has for his wife, the love he has for his kids. Um, there's always some type of story about, you know, one of his, one of his little girls. Um, so you, you tend to appreciate, appreciate somebody willing to share uh, those things. I mean, the, where he started off coaching, um, you know, in the middle of a desert um, to obviously working his way up. Um, you know, he even showed, he'll even show a catch from, you know, I think it was with the coach that he had in preseason or something like that. Um, so it's just like things that you, you, you know, you go and respect and then, you know, there's times where we're going to a meeting and, you know, we'll think it's all about, you know, uh, you know, the opponent, but then we're just in there studying ourselves and, you know, trying to figure out how we can rush the punter and all that kind of stuff. So you just, you just, you know, you grow attached to, to that type of, you know, charismatic person. Um, so Bones was definitely like, I would say, that's why a lot of people love playing for that. They'll run through a wall for, for that guy because, you know, he just respects you. He respects the game of football and he, you know, he listens to you and, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you'll, 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 uh, you know, you run into, you know, whether it's him rushing a punter because, you know, one of his players said, Hey, you know, this might be a good time to do it. So, you know, he's always all ears, um, you know, which a lot of guys appreciate. Oh yeah. And I think that open conversation dialogue is so important, especially when talking about a coach and player relationship and, um, gathering what I have at the start it kind of seems like that hasn't stopped really on all sides of the ball uh stemming from the top all right sorry guys we had to take a brief pause and it won't feel like it for you guys because I paused this but just know when you live in the metroplex and it's raining wi-fi does not exist I don't know it's just a thing um Jay you and I were talking about coach McCarthy and 
Um, the decision to keep him in Dallas, it's not a popular one amongst fans. And I really loved your tweets during the emotional high of everybody finding out um, that Jerry decided to keep Mike for another year uh, to finish out his contract. And no extension in the works right now, but... How do you feel about this decision, given I know because I saw your tweets, but I want you to elaborate on it because it's just a fantastic point of view. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think I think overall, when you talk about the Cowboys and where they've been the past few years, it's like you're always on the edge of your seat during, you know, because they are a really good team. They have all the talent, all the parts in the world. And then, you you know, you win 12 games. You're like, man, we just need one, one you, know, add, you know, add something here or there, and then we get over that hump, and then you go – you know, you win 12 games again, you win a playoff game. So now you're like, hey, you know, next year's our year. Everything falls into place. Um, you know, the Eagles, the Eagles tank the rest of the season. Um, you have, you know, you're going back into your home, you know, your home turf where you can host uh, multiple playoff games uh, until the NFC Championship. If all goes well, you know, you're 16 and 0 at home. You average, you know, 30 plus points. Um, you know, you're, everything is there set up, you know, like I said, to, Go to the NFC Championship, and I, in my belief, it was like, hey, no matter what team it was, I feel like the Cowboys would have finally got over that hump, beat the Niners. Um, as we see, the Lions are playing good football. Um, you know, obviously, the controversial win or whatever that moment was against the Lions, you know, you never know how that would have played out. Uh, but then you get another shot in order to, you know, go back and improve yourself again. And I feel like a lot of people in in the, you know, the highs and the lows of that, you know, that decision made because it was so disappointing that a lot of feelings were were up there. And it's like the the unfortunate part about it is, you know, a lot of Cowboys fans were let down. I'm um, sure the players were let down. I'm sure, you know, the entire football community was like, hey, the Cowboys are really set up to to go and do this. And this is finally that year, you know, they have all the pieces. They've paid the guys. And, um, you know, coming off of, you know, a lot of hot games by CeeDee Lamb and Dak and, and all those guys, I mean, you're, you're really expecting, you know, the best case scenario is that you go, you know, you go out there and you win and, uh, you know, and then you advance and all that kind of stuff, home field advantage. I'm taking the boys every time. But um, unfortunately, that did not happen. Um, unfortunately, the game overall, if you go back and actually watch the tape, it was not a good game um, played by anyone. Uh, obviously, Jake Ferguson played um, played really well, but when you have seven Pro Bowlers, um, you're kind of expecting that. Like, I know at least in, in my perspective, um, being around Coach McCarthy, been around you know all these guys, I don't think coaches go out there and say, "Hey, you know what? We're not going to come prepared." Um, never in my career did I feel like you know there was a couple coordinators and stuff I won't I won't mention um, that I've been around or heard, heard things about that like the guys you know the team and the coordinator really you know, clashed on play calling and stuff like that. I get that, but not Dan Quinn. You know, they, you know, they were, a, you know, top five um, defense, number one offense. Um, so how in that situation, I felt like, how is that anything to do with coaching? Because up until that point, you know, they beat Green Bay. There's a, it's a completely different story, right? Um, your players have to show up, which they did not. Um, you have basically, I want to say maybe the most pro bowlers at any other team or up there at least. And when none of them show up, you know, it's very difficult to say that's a coaching thing. Now I can see if it was like, hey, the, the you know, and on top of that, a lot of people like to say, well, it's the coach's job to go and get them ready. I don't know if, you know, Kyle Shanahan has to go and get his defense ready or his offense ready. I think those guys really come ready and they understand it, right? They understand that like, hey, I'm a pro bowler, I'm all pro. We need to go and get this done. I think that's a player's thing. And I think any player on that team would tell you that they were let down by how they performed. They were let down by whatever it was because Dan, Dan Quinn's scheme is not a hard scheme. A lot of people know that. So I think you can't say, hey, this is, you know, a coaching thing that, you know, receivers were um, left wide open and, and things like that. To me, the system is what the system is, and it's not a difficult scheme. And I've played in multiple systems. Um, and partially Dan Quinn scheme with uh, Chris Richard when he was when he was with the Cowboys. And it's not a scheme that I would say is, is a hard scheme. I would say it's, um, you know, it's definitely something that like the players understand. They thrived in it. Um, they show they could, you know, play well in it. I think it just came down to that day, that game, maybe looking past Green Bay um, like a lot of us did and kind of saying, hey, a lot of people like, hey, we want to get the Niners. And I think maybe the Cowboys maybe felt like that as well. 
And unfortunately, you know, the Packers show what they can do. They show their competitive football team with a lot of talent. They went into into San Fran and, and proved that once again um, that they are who they are. So I think it made you know that part with you know Green Bay going into San Fran and almost winning. I think that kind of you know softened the you know the blow a little bit. But with Coach McCarthy getting back on that that topic, it's it's like you're right there. You have the talent, you have the coaching staff, you have everything you know that you that you need now to go and say, hey, well. Um, you know, look at the Texans and look at all these other coaches that were able to do that. They were also coming off of multiple losing seasons. So it's not really hard to come in and get guys to buy in because what they bought into in the past was, hey, you know, we bought into it, but we're not we're not winning. We're not you know, they're coming off multiple losing seasons. So it's easier to get guys to buy in. Now, when you have the coach, you have, you know, the locker room obviously loves Mike McCarthy. You have, you know, the players that back him, all that kind of stuff. And then they'll be the first one to tell you, hey, we didn't play good. Um, I think I think it's hard to say, hey, well, we can go out there and we can, you know, get Jim Harbaugh and, and he can come in and make this team a Super Bowl contender because you have to. It's like a delicate situation, because if he decides, hey, I'm going back to Michigan, if uh, Belichick says, hey, I'm going to sit out a year, if Rabel says, hey, I'm going to sit out a year, um, what are you like? Who are you going to go get that's going to for sure get you 12 wins and to put you back in that same situation? Maybe even better, because a lot of the games that they did lose you know, they should have won um, if, you know, if we're being honest, but what coach is going to come in and and do that when you pretty much have everything, the players just didn't play good, you know, it's a disappointing loss, um, you know, and then when you, when you can't stop the run in the playoffs, we all know how that go, you know, uh, San Fran, you know, they barely could stop the run and we, we saw they almost lost. So when you think about that and you think about the guys that, um, you know, they drafted in the past draft class that really didn't, um, you know, factor in or help as much as they they hope. Um, I think that's also a problem. We can talk about, you know, the roster. We can talk about the draft class from last year. We can talk about all these different things that didn't really help. We can talk about the fact that, you know, Trayvon Diggs wasn't there. You know, we can talk about all those different factors. Um, and then, you know, you can still say, well, in my opinion, it will still be hard for a coach to come in, bring a brand new staff. You know, the defense has to learn a new system. The They're, they're playing fast. That, that's the thing. They're playing fast. The offense was, you know, so methodical for the past six weeks. Um, to me, they just didn't play a good football game. Um, they have to get over that hump as far as, like, when they're in the playoffs, all their big-time players have to step up and play well, and they just have to win. And I don't think that's a coaching thing. I think that's a player thing. I also think that that might be a personnel thing. You know, you may, maybe you have to go – and saying often, I mean, in, in free agency, hey, we're going to go commit to, you know, a couple more run stoppers, um, you know, when it talks about the the deep tackles you can. And then what I would say is obviously losing uh, Overshown, that was that was pretty big. Losing Layton was pretty big and, and stopping the run because now, you know, you're kind of limited there. And then the fact that the defense was playing pretty well and, you know, towards the end of the year, you can see some glim- glimpses of, you know, a little bit of fault in the run game. Um, at the linebacker position and you know it's no knock to to any of those linebackers obviously but you know when you draft Micah Parsons to be you know a, a linebacker and then he turns into a Hall of Fame edge rusher you have to go in now fill that spot and I felt like they haven't done that yet I felt like you know the the decision to go and get Micah Parsons in the draft was to say hey he's going to be one of the best off-ball linebackers in the game you know Fred Warner um, all those guys and then we're going to blitz him He's going to be able to do a little bit more, but then he's he's a Hall of Fame edge rusher. So like you have to put him there because that gives your your defense the best chance to win. That gives your team the best chance to win. So when you don't go and fill that void, that spot, it makes it tough because you know that's what you kind of went and wanted to do with um with a uh, Mozzie from from Michigan. You want you know, and then for whatever reason it just didn't work out this year. You know, I'm, I'm anticipating he has a bigger year next year when it comes to you know that kind of stuff, but. I feel like the voice they really just didn't fill in that specific area that needed to be filled when Michael Parsons turned into a Hall of Fame edge rusher. Um, so I think I think that was I think it's a little bit more of like personnel. Obviously, um, you know, Dak and CD Lamb was a little off from the very first play um, on offense. The defense, you know, didn't didn't stop the run or you know Green Bay went down, marched down that first drive and scored and. And all that kind of stuff. And then you got, you know, you got picks and you got pick sixes and, you know, all this. It's kind of hard to overcome that kind of stuff. So you just need your players 
you know, your all pro players, your um, pro bowl players to play well when it matters. And, you know, and, and when it matters is, you know, in the, in the playoffs, that first round, get, getting past that. And, you know, it was just, you know, I feel like it was just unfortunate. It was just very disappointing overall. And I think that's what a lot of the Cowboys fans felt like, Hey man, this is super disappointing. Like how could we be 16 to know? And then we get the seven seed um, to come in here, you know, where the number two seed, everything lines up for us to go and, and get to the NFC championship game. And then we'll just see it, see from there. Right. Um, but when that doesn't happen, um, it's a little, it's a little, you know, heartbreaking because it's like, man, we have everything that we need, but um, for like, all we had to do was win, right. All we had to do was play well, win, be the Cowboys, be who we are at home and dominate because, you know, all year, the problem was, or the question was, Hey, can these, can this team play well on the road? Right. So when we get in the playoffs, do we really want a road game or do we want to be at home? Well, you know, the stars align. Um, you know, for it to be at home game every time up until the NFC Championship. Um, they didn't get it done. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when you talk about can a coach come in, bring a whole new staff, a whole new scheme, get you 12 wins, get you to the playoffs, that is a bigger question than it is, you know, what Mike McCarthy has shown, that he can win 12 games. He can make the playoffs every single time. He can do that. So that's something that is already proof in a pudding. Now, you know, how, how often can a, can a guy come in and, and actually do that. I mean, it happened, um, what, the Broncos with Peyton Manning. It happened back yeah. Niners in, you know, 1994 or something like that. But, you know, it's it's very rare that that happens. So unless you're okay with saying, hey, we'll put it all out there, we'll bring in a new coach and whatever it is. Or you can say, let's just sign, you know, let's just keep what we have going. Let's just, you know, run it back. Let's, let's really dive into the personnel. Let's really dive into how can we change those times? How can we you know, play well against, um, you know, the Shanahan tree. How can we play well against that offense? Because that offense is what gives the Cowboys problems. Um, you know, it happened Sean McVay and the Rams back in the day. It happens, um, you know, with the Packers. It happens, you know, with the Niners, all that kind of stuff. It's really the same tree. A lot of motions, a lot of, you know, a lot of, hey, how can we get their brains thinking and then run a basic run play? And oftentimes it happens because there's rules and responsibilities within the defense that you have to have, linebackers that you know can have all that stuff going on and play well on the fly and even though even though the Niners had a little bit of problem with that against the Packers you know they still came up and made some plays you know a pick um, or a couple picks made some nice tackles some nice excuse me TFLs and that kind of stuff and I think that's what was uh missing <clears throat> in that game that obviously you know it took a took the offense a while to really even get going um, which for the number one offense, you would want them to to go and respond quickly and to be on all their P's and Q's. But I just don't see how personally how that would be a coaching thing when the coaching hasn't been a problem. Nobody really questioned it. Um, but the things that people question was, hey, can this team play on a road? Can this team stop the run? And, you know, other than that, everybody I feel like was in was in high spirits. And then it was just such a gut wrenching loss that. Somebody needs to be to blame. And, you know, and that, that comes with the head coach. And that's part of the responsibility. And I know I know Mike thinks that. And I know uh, it comes with the quarterback. I know Dak thinks that. I know Dak wish he, you know, he had some plays back. Um, I know the defense wish, you know, they had some plays back. And unfortunately, you don't get any of those back. You know, your season's over with. Now you have to think about what's the best uh, situation moving forward. And for me, um, like I said, I, I think the best decision they could have made was to keep uh, you know, Mike McCarthy, because it will be hard for somebody to come in and say, hey, this is a new special teams playbook. Um, hey, this is a new offensive playbook. And let's get back rolling when they weren't bottom of the half in the, in the league in offense. They weren't bottom of the half in defense. They were top one, top five in both. So at that point, you know, why would we go and change that um, and, and say that, hey, this is I mean, because it was working. It was working, but it was working until it wasn't. <laughs> and unfortunately, it has to work well. Or you have to find a way to overcome it, um, you know, during those games in the playoffs. And, you know, Cowboys are always going to get somebody's best shot, whether it's from the coach, whether it's from the players. Everybody's going to try to play the Cowboys really well. So um, knowing knowing that, you know, maybe maybe there's something that they can, you know, this offseason dive into and say, hey, can we change our roster up a little bit? What's the chances we can, you know, show a little bit more three, four fronts and heavy up and beef up that interior uh, defensive line? Hey, what's our linebacker situation looking like? Because when you look at, you know, guys like Baltimore, um, you know, San Fran, you look at, I mean, even the Chiefs with a, with a Bolton and, uh, 
And Gay, you think about these guys who, and even uh, Drew Tranquil, or I can't remember, I think that's his name. But you think about these guys who can uh, who can go in and uh, you know perform at a high level, and, and that's what you want. So I think I think the best decision was to keep. You know, I mean, it's, it's one year on his contract, make it or break it. You know, and then at that point, you know, you'll see what what coaches sit out. You see what what coaches you know might you know might might be willing to move on from their team. Um, you see how that all that stuff kind of plays. There's too many questions for a successful year and a successful team um, to really just break all that up because they didn't play well. <laughs> so I think I think it's just hard to, to to go and break all that up just because you know they didn't play well. And I look at as a player knowing these players and knowing how a lot of these guys think they look at themselves before they would even blame a coach. They would say, Hey, you know, it's on us. We have multiple pro bowlers. We have multiple all pros. And how many of those guys can we actually say played well in that game? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you because you mentioned the Shanahan tree and that's a term that's being tossed around left and right as it should be because every single one of your losses and your playoff losses has come from the Shanahan tree, if not Shanahan himself. Um, what exactly, because you've played against that scheme, what exactly makes it, is making it difficult with what the Cowboys have right now, given we just talked about the lack of linebackers and, and them really needing to address that position specifically in the off season. What makes the Shanahan I guess, scheme so different and so hard to beat, especially when it comes to stopping the run. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is um, usually when you, you know, you're in a, in a four through defense, usually you're, you're, you're playing a gap scheme. So this linebacker has this gap, this defensive end has the edge, this defensive end. Now, obviously, there's moving parts within that, but it's usually a gap defense, like everybody owns a gap. Well, what happens is when, you know, there's a motion, the gaps change. When there's a tight end, that motion's back across, the gaps change and then being able to do that on the fly and defend the pass is pretty hard because you know the linebackers have to you know defend deep crossing routes by the tight ends and then you have like you know the the um the the ends that might have to blow up a tight end when he when he comes back across but then they run a boot off of it so then he's looking for contact and then there's a boot off of it and unfortunately that's that's what comes with um the, the the scheme and obviously i'm not in the locker room i'm not in the in those mini rooms so i, I can only speak from um, me knowing you know the basics of a, of a four through defense sure. and uh, you know that that's always pretty tough so those linebackers having to think on the fly the defensive you know the interior guys have to think when you know how they're getting blocked the blocking scheme and i think it, it may i mean it's trouble for just about everyone across the league <laughs> so um no matter no matter what i mean it's a heck of a heck of a coaching tree heck of a scheme and it's always giving people a lot of problems um, because there's so much movement. Even with the Packers, they wouldn't snap the ball. They had all this movement going up until the very last second um, on the play clock before they hiked the ball. And it was like literally they did that against the Niners and literally be like two seconds left. Somebody would come in motion and hike the ball. And then you have to like move back on the fly and all that kind of stuff. And then they're downhill with the football with good running backs. So um, that makes it that makes it tough because as a linebacker, you know, you're kind of moving on the fly. Now there could be some things where you say, "Hey, we, you know, we could have blitzed certain gaps and we could have moved certain things around." But then you have to worry about fitting, you know, the pass fits and you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then, as we saw, a lot of the double routes, you know, the double the double moves when they're going deep across the field and then they come back out is because usually they're, you know, they're running boots and he's going across the field, so you have to run as fast as you can to get over there. And then all of a sudden he comes back out. So a lot of that stuff is is pretty it's pretty tough to defend. Um, and I feel like if you could just keep it at bay and, and stop the run and make them one dimensional, that's kind of where they, you know, where they, uh, where they kind of, you know, stop at like Baltimore did, you know, when they kind of, yeah. when they beat up on them, they made them one dimensional. They got up, got a, got a nice lead. And at that point they could only pass. <laughs> so it's like, you know, yeah. the Cowboys had a nice run in the game, but um, they had to pass. So I think if you can, you know, and a lot of those, you know, a lot of those coordinators elect to have the ball first for a reason so they can milk the clock. They can keep the offense down because these high powered offenses, um, you know, like the Cowboys, when they have the ball and there's a lot of time on the clock and they're not, you know, and they can put up a lot of points. That's that's kind of like when they're at their best. So if we say, hey, you know, we we want the ball and they get the ball. And, you know, I think they did this. I think Green Bay did the same thing to the Niners. Um, you know, you keep them off the field as much as you can. And then, you know, you just you just go and hope that. Um, you know, when they do come back on the field, you're up, you know, <laughs> two scores and they have to pass. And fortunately, that's the situation the Cowboys were in, um, you know, but we, but Baltimore did it too. 
uh, the Niners in the regular season. And, you know, that's what they did. They jumped up on them early and then, you know, they made them one dimensional. And then at that point, you can just chill back, you know, as a defender and say, hey, well, we're just going to stop. You know, we're going to stop CD or <laughs> we're going to, you know, we'll just chill back and pass it and we'll tackle it. Um, so that's kind of like an unfortunate position to be in, um, you know, as a defense. So it's definitely a hard scheme to, scheme to stop. Um, it's definitely not impossible. But I think when when there's a lot of moving parts, you have to have guys, you know, within that that front seven that can go in and and, you know, make the proper adjustments and, and see it for what it is and not, you know, all the smokes and mirror and get past that and just tackle the football. Right. And I think that's where they had trouble. Do you feel like, and and you touched base on this already, and I'm so glad you mentioned Marvin Overshone because what a guy. Yeah. What a guy with just the potential to skyrocket and really make that linebacker room stronger. He's going to come off of an ACL injury. And typically what you see at that point is it takes about a year, uh, give or take, to reacclimate. And a lot of guys will say that, that that's not an injury that's really easy to come back from as far as getting your football body back. Yep. You have DeMarvian that's set to come back and still on track to make his return next season. But then you have Layton, who, you know, the writing's kind of on the walls here that he should call it a career at this point because it's just a reoccurring neck injury. Uh, I know he just had his first daughter. You know, he has he has a dad, uh, dad mind now that he really needs to think about uh, going forward with his future. Do you feel like hypothetically, if those two guys were still in this linebacker room, it would have been sufficient enough to potentially give a better fight than it did during the season, during the losses? Or do you feel like it still needed to be beefed up at this point because you have a younger guy with talent and potential in another young room with uh, Damone Clark and Marquise Bell, but then you also have Leighton Vandresh, who's your veteran. He's the one that's helping and he's coaching you really on the field. And then when he got injured from the sidelines, do you feel like those two guys would have helped or do you feel like overall that's just a room that needs to be beefed up more? Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. And I'll start off by saying uh, Damone Clark and, and uh, Marquise Bell actually played pretty well throughout the season. I was very impressed with a lot of plays they made. Um, so it's, you know, like I said, this is no knock to not no knock to those guys. But, you know, I was you know, I was with the Cowboys when Leighton was there. You know, I saw he learned from Sean Lee. Um, on a lot of those things and being able to understand that movement of certain offenses and get people in the right position. I think it just comes with experience. I think Layton had a lot of experience with going against that type of offense. So I think that's kind of what played a big factor in it is like just having a feel for it and playing against that system a lot. Um, obviously, in Layton, that would have ultimately helped, which would have helped the other linebacker um, because, you know, he's kind of directing the show and saying, hey, this is what we're going to watch out for down the distance type of things. Um, so it just comes with experience. I'm sure uh, Damone Clark and those guys will be better, you know, be better for it next year because they're going to watch the tape. They're going to learn. They've already seen it a few times. And it's just one of those things that, like, you just have to get better um, when you see it. Um, but to answer that question, um, I've seen uh, I've seen a lot of um, – I've seen this trend where, you know, if you get two linebackers that can run sideline to sideline, tackle the football, match up with tight ends – um, and stop the run ultimately is kind of like the recipe. If you ask me, like, you know, find, find two guys or, you know, pick, pick those guys that complement each other. Well, that can both run to the football sideline to sideline that can both cover running backs, both cover tight ends. And, um, you know, you go in, those are the kind of guys you look for for now, because when you think about what San Fran is doing, you think about what Baltimore is doing. Um, you think about, you know, those kind of, those kind of schemes and stuff like that. You think about, hey, if I had two linebackers that I was, you know, which I'm sure the Cowboys are fully confident in, in Bell and Clark. But if you say, hey, this is what the recipe is, how can we kind of, you know, piggyback off of, you know, what these other teams are doing and, you know, finding, finding, you know, what kind of works well um, for that. And then it, then if not, you know, those guys, but the, the I guess the, the hard part is there was times where those guys play really, really amazing games within the system. So it's always hard to say, you know, it's always to say when it's not working out, hey, let's go and replace these guys. Um, but when it's working well, they're like, man, I can't believe, you know, uh, Bell was a safety and he's getting 15 tackles and he gets TFLs and he's punching the ball out, causing him fumbles or the Mon Clark's getting a lot of TFLs and stuff like that. So when they're playing well, obviously everybody, you know, is like, oh, well, you know, can't believe we got a safety that, you know, we, uh, you know, we converted to a linebacker and he's doing really well because, I mean, he is, he's, you know, they're all, they're all uh, great players. So um, I wouldn't say, I want to say that I think they I think the Cowboys in general didn't play well enough, um, obviously, to win. But I also think that 
to answer your question, if you do go in, you you know, what's the worst that can happen? You, you draft the backer in the first round, the second round, and see, you know, and, and just kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, just kind of get back to that point of the fact that you drafted Michael Parsons in order to be be that guy, but he's a Hall of Fame edge rusher. So now you can't ask him to go back and be off ball linebacker and to do that kind of stuff. So maybe, you know, your your plan to, you know, find that guy in Michael Parsons, um, it, it didn't work out and for a good reason, for a great reason, because he's a Hall of Fame edge rusher once again. But um, now you have to actually go and find that guy that you, you tried to do a few years ago um, and just and just go that route. And I think with Overshone, obviously coming off his ACL, that's somebody where they say, hey, this guy can blitz. You know, he's fast. Um, he's athletic. You know, maybe, maybe that's who they, you know, they anticipated being kind of like a Micah, um, you know, with with the ability to be able to rush off ball and cover and all that kind of stuff. So I think they have the right recipe in in um, Overshown, but, you know, it wouldn't hurt to, to maybe go and beef that up or to see what's out there in free agency, um, you know. So, I mean, I don't know if, if Devin White's available. Um, I would, uh, you know, I would, I would definitely, I would definitely, you know, make, make that phone call in the, in the off season, bearing whatever, you know, obviously Layton decides to do and uh, congratulations to him on his, on his little girl. Layton's a good friend of mine. So, um, you know, those, those are things you definitely have to talk about. Hey, is it, is it, is it time to, to, to call up a me knowing Layton? I doubt he will. I doubt he'll, you know, I'm pretty sure he'll want to go out there and compete with his, you know, with his, uh, with his teammates. Cause you know, he's a great team guy, great player. So I would imagine he will want to, you know, have a little bit of revenge, um, you know, and, and show that he's still, you know, late and he's still that guy. So um, with that being said, I definitely would, you know, if, if Devin White's available and he's a free agent, which I'm pretty sure he is, um, you know, I would I wouldn't mind, you know, exercising, you know, that deal. I mean, you have a proven guy that runs sideline to sideline, can cover, um, can tackle, can, can make a lot of plays. You know, you never know. You never know what uh, what that'll bring. But Ooh, are we manifesting it here right now? I think I, I think we're manifesting a little bit now. Bit, depending on what uh, Dan Quinn decides to do, and uh, you know, Ooh, yeah, that's a that's another fun topic. Um, real quick, I wanted to ask you, as far as McCarthy's Texas Coast offense, what did you like from it? What did you dislike from it over the course of the season? Being his first season calling the plays in Dallas, uh, him and Dak's relationship obviously skyrocketed. You can tell the chemistry that they have as uh, coach and player. What did you like from it, and what do you want to see kind of excel or change going into next season? Yeah, I, I like the fact, obviously, featuring uh, C.D. Lim after about you know the week six of the season, and you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always open. And then you know, once you feature him. Um, you know, he's a player that has to be double teamed, right? Or at least accounted for by multiple players. So then you're able to use obviously Brandon Cooks. He had a lot of great things. I mean, having Jake Ferguson, you know, one on one is pretty much a mismatch to just about anybody out there. So um being able to obviously um I guess feature feature CD Lamb is like the you know, the number one receiver, which he is, and then being able to play off of that and um play against, you know, obviously one on one matchups, like I said, with Jake Ferguson. Um, you know, Brandon Cooks is one on one. He's one of the fastest guys. Um, and then ultimately, um, ultimately, you know, obviously, obviously with uh, MG getting him involved there towards the end. But, um, yeah, I, de I definitely like the the fact of how explosive it could be, the fact of how, I guess, time controlling it could be. They can have the ball for a long time and march down very methodical in their own way score come back you know it might be a, a deep ball that nobody was expecting Brandon Cook catches it and then you know or you feature and you just give it to CeeDee Lamb and he you know he he finds a way to to make it happen to score so I definitely liked uh how um how time controlling it was you can control the clock as well as how versatile you know it is versatile it, it is in in featuring different guys and and you know letting Jake Ferguson be the guy that you you know you get the ball you get the ball to or Brandon Cooks on a deep route um, I think all those things um, was actually actually really well. I mean, early on we had some we had some questions, and you know, hey, how good is the red zone offense? And then you know, we really didn't second guess it, you know, because having a great kicker obviously uh, that helped because you can pretty much just. Butter Aubrey was pretty butter <laughs> and pretty clutch. <laughs> so that opens up your you know that opens up your offense as well. So definitely. Last question: the run game. We were talking about the run defense. Run game on the offensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. 
what do you feel like was the biggest I guess, issue this season? Because it was disappointing. However, when you have a Texas coast or West coast offense, it's more pass heavy. So I, I don't think people expected this offense to be as pass heavy as it was. Do you think that the production from the run game is where it needed to be? And if not, keep in mind, both Tony Pollard, Rico Dowdle heading into free agency, what do they do in your opinion to kind of amp up that run game and take the take that offense to the next level in that aspect yeah so uh i, w- I would say they kind of struggled early on obviously with uh tony pollard getting back and um it's just a different feel right because you have running backs that fill the run game a little bit differently so obviously with uh with rico um obviously he he showed what he can do once you get into the red zone and you know handing the ball he's pretty much in the end zone but um, I think Tony Pollard was just kind of getting back into his groove, obviously from, you know, I'm sure he's completely healed from his injury, but as far as like just the feel of it, um, you can definitely tell that there was, you know, um, something that was lacking a little bit, obviously with, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe it was just because of how the, you know, the, the run calls and maybe where the ball's supposed to cut back at, you know, completely different offense than it was obviously last year um, in the run game, like you mentioned, but um, I think, I think another, another year, of the offensive line kind of filling out the run game and what that looks like will help any running back that's back there. So I think it kind of starts obviously with that. And then, you know, they had, you know, a few injuries earlier in the year and all that kind of stuff. So they were always kind of shuffling the O line a little bit, uh, which also could have been, could have been, a um, you know, a factor that played into that. So I think having that offensive line, you know, repping that another year and, you know, how, how that's supposed to look, where the ball's supposed to cut back at um, different ways to block, you know, certain looks, um, for that offensive scheme, I think that that'll be the game changer. So um, I think I think it's just, you know, I think it's just experience and repetition. Jay, always such a pleasure talking to you. Always make me smarter uh, every conversation we have. But where can people find you so they can look at your glorious tweets? And they're finding you in the Cowboys offseason, if that gives y'all any uh, incentive for the day. Where can people find you? Uh, yeah, they can find me just simply at Jay March um, on Instagram, Jay March on Twitter. And if you want to look out for some things, all mental health uh, wise, you can find me at the mental health locker room on Instagram. Um, and we'll be, you know, talking about a lot of mental health uh, topics. Um, you know, all in all, we all struggle in, in different ways when it comes to mental health and what that looks like. And it looks different for everybody. So it'll be a great space um, as the locker room usually is great space to talk, you know, life and, and to, to learn about what somebody else might be going through that may help you. So I'm um, hoping to open that platform up for, um, you know, a lot of athletes to come on there and talk about mental health and how that, you know, how that plays a factor in preparing for a game, uh, how that plays a factor in, you know, after a loss. Um, so I hope to find a lot of you tuning into that um, as our world is in a difficult place at times. Absolutely. It's going to be fantastic to, like you said, open up that conversation to listen, uh, getting points of view that make us all better and smarter. Uh, and just remembering everybody is always going to something, whether they show it or not. I think that's such an important platform. So thank you uh, for opening up that conversation. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you for joining us today, Jay and everybody else. We'll be back next week with another episode of the PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. Until then, go be awesome. Have a great day and check on your loved ones. Bye, guys.